Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to Room by Room, the home organization science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We're champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from Nam, Melbourne, Australia. Let's begin. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be talking about the supportive steps for helping loved ones escape squalor with Colette Oswald, who is a registered and certified child and youth care counsellor, a trained professional and virtual organiser with level one certificates in the study of ADHD and chronic disorganisation and owner of Organising by Oz. Hi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, Before we get started with our topic, do you mind introducing yourself in a bit more detail? Sure. So my name's Colette and I live in Canada. Uh, I grew up in Victoria, so by the ocean and have made my way a little further west and reside in Calgary with my family. Uh, I've lived here for about 13 years now. My whole background though is being child and youth care focused. So lots of casework with nonprofit and government, helping families for over 20 years set up routines uh, to better their lives. And so That's how Organizing by Oz came to be about seven years ago. I love organizing. That's my passion. I'm that friend you call when you're moving and want to set up your house and all the pretty bins and stuff. Um, But my background in mental health has given me the passion to help families who are struggling with chronic disorganization and squalor, uh, what we call hoarding in North America. So that's kind of why I'm here today uh, to share some tips and strategies to help the individual who's in the squalor, but most importantly, how uh, how families and friends can support. Mm, yes, because I think that, you know, often people who are in these situations, um, it can be a lot very difficult to reach out and find support. Whereas, you know, if you're looking in at someone else's life, it's a lot easier to find the problems, you know, um, but then there's, you know, the how do you help them? What do you do to help them? How do you not make it worse. Uh, But we're going to talk about that very soon. But first of all, we're going to do a section called Have You Met Colette, uh, where we get to know you through some of your favorite things. And the first thing I would like to know is what is your favorite book? Oh, my goodness. It depends on the topic. So my favorite uh, organizing book right now is um, What Every Professional Organizer Needs to Know by Judith Kohlberg. Uh, I was just in a conference in September in Boston. Um, where it was all on chronic disorganization and I got to meet her. And so I've been reading her uh, book. Um, So that's my favorite right now. And then just, uh, I'm kind of boring because of course, anything to do with cognitive behavioral therapy or anything new to do with mental health, I'm kind of a research nerd. So I'm reading um, research papers that come into my inbox from psychology today or from the ADAD or ADD network, um, just to keep my skill sets up. So that's kind of what I read. Yes, that's, um, it's something that I think, um, a lot of people should be doing, you know, particularly if you're in the mental health area. Um, and, uh, but it can be a little bit, I guess, tedious. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> Yeah, I, like I said, I, it's, I'm a nerd of, around the research and brain research mm-hmm. and all of the changes with uh, epigenetics and neuro, um, just the neurotransmitters. It's really fascinating time for brain research right now. Great. Um, and have you enjoyed any movies recently? Uh, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the last movie and I'm going to age myself probably. It was the recent Top Gun movie, which was probably like three years ago or two or three years ago now. <laughs> I think yeah. it was last year. I can't remember. I didn't okay. watch it, unfortunately. Okay, year out. Phew. Okay. <laughs> and what did you like about it? Well, obviously I saw the original <laughs> like 20 plus years ago. So it was fun to see uh, the new one. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it was, it's just an escape movie. 
So because I'm so focused all the time on brains, it's nice to turn mine off and just be entertained. Um, mm. And so, of course, it had all of the dynamics of action, adventure, little mystery, you know, all of those dopamine pieces I need because I, too, have ADHD. So um, I'm always needing the distractibility as well. Mm. And I think it's good, you know, obviously to learn things, but also realize that sometimes you need to relax a bit and turn the brain off. We do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and do you listen to any podcasts? Oh, I have many. Um, sadly, they're all on science and research. <laughs> uh, so I am, I love yours. And I also um, listen to the, a lot of ADHD ones because uh, that's what I specialize in is neurodiversity uh, families. So brain injury, ADHD, autism, uh, and then the chronic disorganization spectrum, which includes hoarding. Mm -hmm. So I work with lots of um, psychologists and therapists um, with their families. And uh, so, yeah, all my podcasts are sadly research based. <laughs> I mean, for anyone who who is interested, are there any that you would recommend? Oh, man, um, there's so there's so many. Um, I probably have way too many on my uh, I'm just looking at my podcast. Uh, I have a podcast thing here. Um, like eight, but well, attitude, which is uh, in North America, the ADHD experts. Um, of course, room by room, um, hacking your ADHD. Um, yeah, from you know ADHD to amazeability. Like these are just <laughs> what I, I listen to. Pro Organizer Studio is uh, all about organizing, and uh, the Fempreneur podcast is uh, um, in Calgary. Here, I'm part of the Fempreneurs. And so they have a podcast where they showcase um, different female entrepreneurs. So those are kind of the top ones on my podcast list right now. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that anyone who, who is interested in, you know, organization, but also in psychology and mental health is going to love those suggestions. Um, and do you have a role model? Oh, well, to be to be fair, uh, Peter Walsh got me into organizing. I think he was my very first organizing book. Um, mm -hmm. So he's kind of my role model for organizing. But then um, uh, Judith Kohlberg as well as in organizing because she really speaks to the mental health piece and a lot of her her books. And and, and my my second book was her ADHD uh, book on organizing. So those are two of my role models um, for just the helping profession. Mm, amazing. Thank you. And have you completed any courses that have inspired you? Oh, uh, many. Because when you have ADHD, you're constantly, <laughs> you're either crafting, like, oh my goodness, so many of my friends start these projects, which I am not a crafter at all. Um, my daughter actually was delayed in her fine motor skills when she started preschool because I, I just hated it. So we never cut scissors. We never did crafts. Like she was so delayed. I felt really bad. We did other fun things like going outside and playing and like going to do all those. But um, so, yeah, like and see, I got distracted by a question. So that's the part of ADHD, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Distractibility. That's OK. So uh, what courses have inspired you? Oh, thank you. Um, oh, gosh. Um, it's really hard because, again, I sound so boring, but um, it's all um, the neuro research right now. So I've been, uh, so Institute of Chronic Disorganization is an organization in the States, the United States, that I'm part of. Um, and so it's all around education of brain injury, neurodiversity, um, and so those are kind of the courses I've been doing that give keep my passion going and, and then I can pass it on to my clients and their families. So again, there's like a definite pattern I'm noticing as I'm answering all your questions. <laughs> no, but I love that because, you know, it really shows that you are very knowledgeable about and passionate about this topic and that you're not just taking one book that you read, you're taking multiple sources of information and synthesizing it into your work. Um, so yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to say every family is unique. So you can't just bring in one tool. Like you have to bring in a whole bunch of tools um, to meet the diverse needs of the families. So I feel, um, yeah, like, and continuous improvement is so important because we are learning so much more about the body and how it all works together and, 
and all of our like dopamine and serotonin and how that impacts mood and brain. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. Well, I find mm. it fascinating. Other people would probably be so bored, but anyway, I find it very curious. Well, this episode today is for the people who find it fascinating. Yay, then I'm in the right spot. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So today we are going to be talking about squalor, about hoarding, about mental health. So are there anything that we need to know before we get started? Yes. Um, so anytime we're talking about mental health um, or any topic, really, we never know what might trigger someone. So even though I'm really cautious around what I'm saying and the language that I'm using, um, there might be a story I share or there might be a book or a chapter in a book that is, is triggers you. Um, so if that happens, please always reach out to your support professionals um, and seek help. Like don't, don't isolate yourself. Don't sit in it alone. Make sure you reach out and talk to somebody. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Very important to keep in mind. Um, and before we do get, you know, right into this topic, um, I'd like to define a few things so we know what we're starting with. Um, so how do you define home organization? Wow. It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> so I know that's a boring word of it depends, but home, home organization can be like the home edit that you see or space invaders like you have in Australia with Peter Walsh, um, where you either have the perfect home that looks like showroom ready, or you're looking like Peter Walsh's space invaders where it's the, the mess. Um, and so somewhere in the middle I, is the messy middle, I call it. Um, we all are so busy right now. Like we have never, there's tons of research showing how busy we are as human beings right now. Like our phones, we're never down. We're, we're always connected somewhere. Our brains are never getting to rest. We're constantly go, go, go. And so when you think about all of the kids' schedules and then your schedules, um, your family schedules, like I'm in the middle generation myself where I'm still raising my kid, my daughter, but I'm, um, I'm helping my aging parents. So we have an entire, like when you think of lifespan development, home organization meets all of it from the birth where all of a sudden that little person has huge amounts of stuff coming into the home. Where are you supposed to find stuff for it to you've, you've lost a loved one and now you're going through their stuff and you're downsizing. Um, so it's the full lifespan and, you know, relationships change um, you know, health and mobility change. And so home organization will constantly change as your lifespan, as you move through the lifespans. I hope that helps see that it's yeah. not just born and done. You're constantly evolving as, as your life evolves, as you age. Mm. And so we're going to be talking about hoarding and squalor today. Do you mind, you know, defining what those are and if there's a difference, if they're the same? Yeah, there is a difference. Um, so in the DSM-5, which is the mental health model, uh, the diagnostic mental health that we all use, um, they definitely have um, hoarding disorder in there now. And it's um, it's under there, uh, but there's always comorbidities. Uh, comorbidities, I can never say that word. Where, comorbidities. Thank you. That's the way you say it. I always butcher it. Um, where it's not just isolated to hoarding, uh, it could also include anxiety, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. It can uh, include depression um, and those types of things. So it's all kind of under that mental health umbrella. So when we're talking about squalor or hoarding, we're really talking about like in terms of um, support, not just having someone come in and organize, but what mental health support will there be? So usually that's therapy. So cognitive, I use a lot of cognitive behavior, behavior therapy in my sessions with clients um, because that's what I'm trained in. Um, if you are working with someone who significantly um, has a hoarding disorder, so the Institute for Chronic Disorganization has a hoarding clutter scale that we'll share in this um, at the end. So people, if they're interested, and I find it when I share it with families and clients, it really helps them understand where this may have started and research is, is telling us that hoarding tendencies or chronic disorganization tendencies really start in childhood um, like around eight um, so that's kind of the new research coming out um, that just came out like in September 
And, and so when we're thinking about, again, lifespan development, we then move into teenagehood, we move into our first apartments, uh, and then we move into homes and we have kids or our relationships change and we have blended families or our culture has blended families of all generations living under the same home. And, and so when we're talking about the differences in the mental health side of it, um, it's not an easy, the people who are diagnosed with hoarding is very small. More people are diagnosed with anxiety, ADHD. Um, those are more kind of life challenging, like they're, they're really limiting their ability to do day-to-day pieces. Um, but hoarding, according to um, research, I'm just looking at the definition for you here. Um, yeah, so it says all people who hoard are can certainly be classified as chronically disorganized because that is um, they have a past history of disorganization in which self-help efforts to change have failed. Their quality of life due to disorganization is undermined and there is a future expectation of disorganization. So that's chronic disorganization, the definition. Uh, and when it's becoming hoarding, their quality of life is significantly impacted. So they may no longer be going outside. Um, they may no longer want to have people in their homes. You'll often see your friends and family may be like, oh yeah, you'll chat with them in the driveway or you'll never get into the home anymore because um, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated with all of that as well, which leads to the de- anxiety, the depression, um, those types of um, challenges. So. Um, hopefully that helps. And like I said, the the level one to five clutter hoarding scale really mm-hmm. goes through like level one. There's like lots of clutter and it's starting to impact day-to-day functioning where level five is the heat, the hot water, nothing is functioning. The home is literally falling apart. Um, bedroom, like normal rooms no longer have their traditional means or their t- traditional functions. Like Toilets aren't working, kitchens aren't accessible, there's rodents, there's bugs, um, the roof is caving in, like that's the extreme. So the clutter scale, um, you know, if we can catch it and really help families understand the why, there's always a why behind um, the clutter. Mm. And what, what about the difference between hoarding and squalor? So in North America, we call it hoarding, which in when I was looking up squalor, it's this is the same. It's just a terminology difference. Um, So squalor is uh, my understanding from reading your Australian research is, again, it's life impacting. So it's people aren't able to function in their home. Um, It's causing health problems. And when you think about breathing in rodent feces or pet feces or their own feces because their toilets aren't working, standing water because the sinks haven't been used, um, garbage, like it really impacts health um, on a physical level. And that what's really interesting is we also have body memory. So when I'm working with my clients who are serious hoarders or, or in squalor, they won't see, it's like they have clutter blindness. They actually won't see what I see because their bodies, they just step over it um, because they're, they they have that body memory. It's its fascinating to me because I'm, I'm constantly watching where I'm going because there's so much stuff um, in the way I don't want to trip, but they never, like they, they're, you know, they're not tripping because they're stepping over because they just, they remember and they'll, they'll tell you exactly where something is, which is fascinating because it will be under like two feet of newspapers and they'll be like, oh, that article is down there. And sure enough, you go and get it. And that is where it is. So it's, it's the brain. It's, it's fascinating. Um, that's why I'm so like intrigued by the research. Mm. So you mentioned before um, that there's always a cause for, for hoarding and that it can start as, and uh, hoarding tendencies can start as early as eight. So what are, obviously we can't list every single cause, but what are some of the common causes and how, I guess, do they manifest as we age? Yeah. So a lot of it is, is childhood. So, you know, when we are the nature nurture, 
Um, so normally, like there's no evidence yet linking it as a hereditary piece or, you know, being passed down. But if you are, if you, if you have a family member that has hoarding tendencies, there's likely others in the family that will have hoarding tendencies because it's a repetition of patterns of, for that family. So if you're a family that's just grown up in, in a, a really cluttered environment, um, and you clear it out, like I had one client I was so proud of her. We'd been working on a month and she hadn't purchased anything. Cause I always tell my clients before you go out, cause shopping is, is a lot of the addiction. Um, so a lot of our, the families that I work with, they're very isolated. So of course, if you go to a store, the store clerk is going to be very nice to you because they want your money. Um, and so they're getting that social interaction and that need met of um, instant gratification, but then it sits in a bag and it's never seen again. So I'll always tell my clients, like, go to your store first, shop in your store, walk around your house and go shopping. Um, one of my clients even has a shopping um, basket and she'll go around and she'll shop in her store um, because I'm trying to help her break that spending habit. Right. But she still needs that dopamine hit of going shopping. Um, so it's just, you know, giving strategies like that for clients um, or their family members, like, please stop buying gifts. Um, by experiences, um, a lot of people with hoarding tendencies, they need to get out. Um, they need to, to, so get them a gift card that forces them to go to a restaurant or forces them to go for coffee somewhere or forces them um, out, you know, to go to the zoo with the grandkids, um, something like that instead of stuff, if that makes sense. And then health, health changes too is a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, so you might have been that organized person that was able to mm -hmm. maintain your job and then a life event happened. So you either lost your job, which meant you lost your paycheck, which meant you lost your benefits, um, which meant your social socioeconomic status might have dropped. And now you're starting to hoard because mm -hmm. you can't you can't let things go because you don't know when your next paycheck is going to be. Or you don't know when your next meal might be. I mean, these are drastic situations but people start to panic, right? Um, or you might have had an injury or a health change that has totally immobilized you. You used to be able to do this and now you can't. And so that causes a lot of tripping hazards where I have to come in and really reassess the home in terms of safety. Um, and so, yeah, like those kind of tendencies. So trauma, um, it can be like body trauma, it can be anything that someone finds traumatic because what I might find traumatic, someone else may not, but what I may not find traumatic, someone may find hugely traumatic. So we can't just say a trauma has happened and minimize it. To them, mm -hmm. it's huge and it's impacted their ability to see things um, like clutter in a, in a healthy way. They're now seeing it as I must protect, I must keep everything versus but it's broken. It has mold on it. You know, tell me, tell me the story behind why this, why you need to keep this. Um, and so categorizing is another strategy, but the, the, the commonality of hoarders is that yes, categories are great for organizing, but a lot of our hoarding clients or squalor clients, um, have too many categories. They, mm -hmm. they need it to be super specific. So you might have like 10 categories with one or two things in it, instead of having three bigger categories with like five or 10 things in it, if that makes sense. Mm, okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, it doesn't start out, you don't, you know, something something traumatic happens, you don't immediately go to the scale, uh, to the five on the scale, you start off at, you know, one, and then you move along. So, I mean, with, with friends and family, how do you spot the first signs that this is happening so that you can, you know, provide assistance? Yeah, so the big one, um, and so the book I'm holding up, it's called Filled Up and Overflowing, and it's by um, Diane Quintana and uh, John Beatty, and mm -hmm. they have a whole section called Warning Signs. Um, so page 110 is where I'm reading and it's just um, some signs that may alert you that a friend or loved one has a problem with hoarding or the person experiences distress when giving items away or even considering giving items away. Like they go into like a panic or an anxiety, heightened anxiety. Um, and the person feels safer when surrounded by possessions 
or having a living space filled or blocked by stuff. And that I got distracted in sharing with my client, but we had been working and she'd been doing so great and shopping in her store, but we removed like her, her home was clear and she was excited. But then the very next day she went to the dollar store and spent $200 and filled the space again because she was, she realized her things gave her comfort and it was mm -hmm. too empty. And so that told me we had gone too fast, even though it'd been a month and it was, you know, just an hour or two every session and it was at her pace and she was confident with the decisions. I'm also really big on knowing the charities that are looking for places or looking for specific things. So when I'm talking to a client, I'll say, you know what, this charity right now is looking for exactly these things. Um, mm -hmm. This is what it's going to. Um, like, and, and things like bikes, like a lot of my clients have excessive bikes or a lot of construction material. And so I've connected with schools who have bike repair programs and construction programs. So I'm able to help, um, my clients give that stuff away, knowing it's going, not, it's not going to go to the landfill because mm -hmm. a lot of my clients, um, they're huge on recycling because we've had this ever since, you know, 200 plus years of, of, um, you know, reusing things. Uh, then we had the depression. Uh, now we have our environmental challenges. And so a lot of more people are like, I don't want to throw it away. I want to repair it and fix it, which, yeah, I mean, yes, repair and fix it if you can, but if it's going to, is it worth repairing and fixing? Um, and can someone else benefit from trying to repair it and fix it like a high school? who repairs and fixes small engines, right? Like, so those are, you know, connecting with charities or groups where I can help my clients see where it's going is, is helpful, a helpful strategy for family and friends. But those are kind of the red flags. And I mentioned them earlier too. If, if your family all of a sudden is like, no, no, um, can I go to your place? Or is always like, can we go out to a restaurant? Um, or we can we do this and that? Um, because it's very hard for the family when they walk in, um, most of my families cry. Um, the, the family and friends, they're horrified, like horrified that their family member is living like this. Um, and I have to really gently say to them, but your family member has been living like this for a long time and they're okay with it. It's you that we need to kind of work on a strategy because when you react this way, you've closed the door to the help because mm -hmm. now the family member is feeling judged and they're already feeling judged. They've, it's taken a huge amount of courage to have anyone enter the home. Even me, one of my clients would hide in the bathroom for an hour before feeling safe enough to come out and talk to me. And I would just keep working away and talking to her through the bathroom and you know, letting her know what I was doing and sorting things into like items so that when she felt ready, we could tackle a small pile together. Right. And mm -hmm. I never, please, 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 family and friends, do not secretly throw things out. Oh, you have lost any trust. You're never getting it back. Um, mm -hmm. And that family member is now going to be like, nope, I have to look at every single thing. Um, and then that's called churning in our language and our organizing language where they have to look at it like 10 times before they can let it go because there's no trust there. It's lost. Mm. So I think I rambled a bit. Sorry, I got That's off topic. Okay. Yeah. No, so I mean, that it sort of links into the next question I'm going to ask, which is, so, you know, once you, you know, you've you found that your family or friend, you know, maybe needs some help, what are the next steps? I'm guessing it's not throw everything out and <laughs> clear the whole place out because um, it seems like, you know, even you, a professional, went a little bit too fast and uh, this person had to, to find some comfort. So how do you broach this topic and how do you help them to start, you know, maybe getting rid of stuff or making it safer? Yeah, um, get professional help um, mm -hmm. and make sure when you're interviewing, because I always like, so I offer a 30 minute free consultation because I know I'm not going to be the right person for everyone. And that's why I love my network of organizers because I'll be like, oh, my friend, like she she niches in this, like she'll be perfect for you where I'm not. 
Um, it's the same when you're looking for a helper for your family member. They need to have compassion. They need to be able to go at the pace of the client. Um, sometimes my my sessions, we don't actually get anything done mm -hmm. because it's turned into a counseling session around helping them see where it started, um, helping them have self-compassion. Sometimes my clients, um, the negative self-talk and the shame um, and the guilt is so huge. It's um, like they can hardly breathe, right? Uh, it's so um, immobilizing. So if, if I walk in and I'm like, how are you feeling today? I always do a check-in. What's the biggest thing you're most worried about today? Mm -hmm. Let's tackle the elephant in the room. You don't want me here. I get that. Um, but we have bylaw. So I work with bylaw officers. They're going to come in and they're going to remove all your stuff. I would rather you have decision-making power over that as much as possible versus someone else. Because I know when that happens, six months from now, it's going to be full again because they didn't have any autonomy over the decision making. So just helping families see like they've lived in this already for probably several years, um, but it's usually a life event has happened, like they've fallen or they have chronic um, lung problems um, and the doctors are like, okay, something's going on in the house. Like, so then you go in and you're just like, wow, this the smell is overpowering. Like. I have like a hazmat suit sometimes, depending on the level of the families I'm working with, because it's not healthy for me. I even have um, glasses that um, protect my eyes because uh, I was talking to my eye doctor one day and, and I said, I'm so sorry, my lungs, um, I was just in a, one of my clients and I, I had like a mask on, but um, I still always get congested after. And he said, well, what are you doing to protect your eyes? Because I said, my eyes are always like so burning and watery after. And he's like, well, of course, because they're porous, like they're they're taking all that in. So um, so family members, please mask up um, and let your let your family members know, like your body's used to this. My body is not. I'm trying mm -hmm. to be respectful and I'm trying to be helpful and I want to be here with you but I need to protect my eyes and I need to protect my lungs. So you're, you're honoring where they're at, but you're also protecting yourself in a kind, as kind of way as, as you can. And COVID really helped me with that because it was like, everyone's masked up now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyways. Mm, COVID has done a few good things. It's now way more very acceptable few. to wear, very few, but it's more acceptable to wear a face mask when you've got a cold on the train, which is, I enjoy that. Well, not Definitely. enjoy, but I appreciate it. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, yeah. So if you're a family member, I guess, accept them, don't act horrified, find professional help and don't throw things out without discussing it with the person and protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I go in uh, and only bring in things that you know the, the family member you're helping is ready for, like mm -hmm. leave the bins for sorting in your car because the family member might not be there yet. They might not be ready for that yet. You may just be going in and tackling a drawer and mm. that takes them an hour or two just to make decisions on that one drawer or this one pile. Um, and so just letting your agenda go. I know you want to go in and just clean sweep, um, but it's not going to be helpful. Like you see it on the hoarding shows. It's so traumatic. Like, and then some of my hoarding clients have like anthropomorphizing, which is another um, mental health disorder. It's pretty extreme where every single object has a soul. Like they believe it's alive. So one of my clients, for example, we were just going through boxes, like, you know, Amazon boxes, like, you know, product boxes. And she let one go, which was huge. And, but she said, but I can't, it needs to have a match. It can't go to the recycling alone. And so I, I was excited at first. I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to get two boxes out. Um, and then she wouldn't let me carry it. Like she had to carry it to my vehicle and she had to say goodbye to them and she had to thank them. 
So that's like anthropomorphizing, um, which is like really extreme. But, you know, people with squalor, they see things differently. Um, everything has a purpose. Everything has a story. So even having patience to hear the story, like, tell me the story about why you want to keep this or why, you know, if there's 10 items, I'll say, which two bring you the most joy? You know, um, Mary Kondo, like which two really like make you happy? Um, which two kind of make you sad? Um, can we let those sad things go? Because that's like some negative energy coming in here. Can we let that that sad energy leave your space? Um, and so, yeah, like you're just kind of working with them in a kind and compassionate way, trying to help them understand and, and help them with the decision making because they get decision fatigue really quickly because um, mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming. Mm. And so... What are some sort of ways of talking to your your loved ones that, you know, can help to bring them into this place? You've mentioned, you know, listening to them and listening to the stories and talking about why they want to keep things. But what are some other strategies for helping people to either see, seek professional help or to, you know, sort through their items and get rid of things? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a challenge. Um, even for myself, who has lots of the training and experience, there's some clients that just are not ready. And I'll just, I'll, you know, their family will call me They're, you know, and they're usually in their thirties or forties and they're just frustrated. They're beyond, they're angry. They're just, you know, how much, you know, stress this is causing my parents seeing this person, like my family member living like this. Um, and then just again, could you just go in with some dumpsters and clear it out? And I'll say, no, I can't. It's really unethical. Um, I can't do that. There's other organizers who will for sure. Um, but me, because of my mental health background, that's going to really crush and that could spiral their loved one into like serious mental health crisis. Um, and so if they are at a level like between a level three and a five on the clutter boarding scale, I'll really suggest they reach out to a psychologist who specializes in squalor um, and hoarding because it takes um, some special care um, to help their family, loved ones. And I'll also suggest um, they read about squalor. They mm -hmm. read about um, hoarding and under the DSM-5. Um, and I'll give them the clutter hoarding scale so they understand um, a little bit better. Um, so one of the other books that I've, you know, read about all the time. And I'm constantly, you'll see I have tabs everywhere because um, I'm constantly referencing these when I'm working with families, um, is the ICD Guide to Chronic Disorganization. Uh, it's for professional organizers. And again, it's from the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. But in here, they talk about the Fordian scale. Um, and they, they go through so many pieces of it um and for for family and friends like um how to ask the questions how to be supportive um when you're frustrated because even me as an organizer i'll get overwhelmed because it's overwhelming it's mm -hmm. it's shocking at times how people can live and function the way they are in for what i see is just total unsafe places so um, again, some of those strategies will be, um, I really talk about bylaw. So I get to know like um, in Calgary, so I, I do virtual organizing all over the world. I have clients in Mexico and Thailand, um, for example. And so I read up on their bylaws. And so then I can come from a fact based. It's not me telling you how, what to, how to do your house. It's the city or the community that you live in that says this is the community standard. And so how can I support you in this gentle way as possible in meeting the standard? Mm -hmm. What do you need from me? Um, what isn't going to help? Because a lot of my clients have had had organizers before um, and they've been they've fired them because they've secretly thrown things out or um, they've just come in and, and got rid of everything. And um, yeah, so um, again, please don't do that because then you're never going to have trust. I know I keep saying that, but you think you're helping. I'm just going to sneak this out. They remember everything. 
They know where mm. everything is. It's it's fascinating to me. Like thousands of things in their home, thousands, and they will remember. Oh yeah, it's under that pile over here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's helpful if I answered your question. I babbled again. No, that's okay. Something I do want to ask is, so obviously, you know, it there's there's a huge amount of, we're talking about what we can do for people who have hoarding conditions, who, um, but what can the people who are helping them, their loved ones, when they're confronted with this, what can they do to like ensure that their well-being? you know, you're dealing with someone, you're frustrated. What can you do to make sure that you don't, uh, um, end up, you know, maybe being, um, hurting your own well-being. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so part of buy packages is the whole family aftercare. So mm-hmm. during a session, um, I'll be checking in with the extended family. Like, so after a session, um, and the families, like the client I'm working with knows that that's just part of my process is there's no secrets. I'm not going to be triangulated in because that's a really common pattern. People are like, oh, we'll just secretly talk to Colette on the side. No, I don't do that at all. I want really open, honest communication um, because there's been too many secrets. The The client has been secretly hoarding. The family member is like, oh my God, in shock. Um, and everyone's needs to stop not talking. They need to talk. Um, and so... I'll, I'll check in with the family and I'll say, how are you doing today that we only got one box removed from the home? You know, um, what support do you need um, to see that we're making progress? Uh, or if they're super um, overwhelmed and crying because some of my clients are so angry, they're crying, um, I'll just suggest they seek some uh, professional help too um, because it's, it, it is a frustrating process for everyone involved. Um, it's a mental health condition. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of a, if you look at it from a disease model, if we have someone with cancer, we're going to be way more compassionate about the way we talk about cancer, the way we talk about treatment. Um, there's lots of options. Like we're just more caring when we look at it from a disease model lens where hoarding is still very stigmatized. Any mental health is we as a society, even though COVID right now we're in a huge mental health crisis worldwide um, because of COVID and isolation and all of that. So it's opened up the ability to talk about mental health and the struggles um, more openly without all of the judgment. But hoarding is very judged still, and having a family member with hoarding is embarrassing. Um, that's how a lot of my clients feel like I'm so embarrassed or they're filled with guilt. Like, I can't believe I didn't know this. How long has my family member been suffering like this? Like then they feel guilt and shame and hurt, um, as well, especially if there's been loss of parents and they started to take over kind of that parenting role for their siblings. Um, there's just a lot of guilt. And so I'll say, you know, maybe you need to go and see a professional to help you through this grief and loss or help you through the the emotions that are coming up because that's not my specialty, right? I'm a counselor. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm very hugely, I disclose that openly. Um, you know, they have specialized training. I have, you know, this type of training. So yeah, but it, it's hard. Like, and yeah, it's hard work and it's frustrating and not everyone can do it. And so even being able to say, I'm not the family member that can support you in this, but I can support you in paying for someone to come in and help you if you're ready for that. And so when I do my um, my phone consult with the client, I'll always ask them like, so one of the things too I, I use a lot is this book um, I'm holding up is a thousand and one solution focused questions. Um, and so one of them is a scaling question like on a scale of zero to 10, how terrified are you in having come to your home today? Uh, what is one thing I can do to help lessen that overwhelming ang- anxious feeling? Um, mm. and so, you know, just then they're all, then they'll, they'll always say to me, oh, you're not going to come in and tell me what to do. I say, no, you're the boss. You know, mm-hmm. so you're you're the boss. I'm not going to secretly hide things. I'm not going to steal them away. 
they're always sh- shocked with me when, um, like I had one client, she wouldn't even throw up banana peels that were so dried up um, until I just asked her, like, tell me the purpose of holding these banana peels. And she was like, oh, I was going to use them for this project, this art and craft project. And I said, oh, well, do you want to feel it? Do you think that it would still work for that project? And she felt it and it crumbled because it was so old. And she said, oh, this isn't going to work now. And she was able to throw up a pile of um, banana peels. But Mm -hmm. until I'd asked her that, right? So if a family member comes in and sees the banana peels, they're going to assume it's all garbage. So please, again, just lay it out and, and talk them through it. But, um, and I wouldn't do like some of my families are like, well, can you just do four to six hours and just get it done? No, like one hour, your family member is going to be done. You're going to be done because this is going to be happening because you Mm -hmm. want your agenda. You want it clear. They're not ready. Um, and so again, just letting them know, um, it's a process sometimes though, like by law, I'll, I'll say like, we only have today. They're coming tomorrow. So what key pieces do you not want them to take? Can we can we clear out, like, this is what they listed on the bylaw. Can we focus on those areas today? Um, and so that kind of helps too. Um, but don't tackle the whole house. Literally look at it in terms of little zones. Um, because when you walk into the home, you're not going to recognize any of the rooms anyway. Like mm-hmm. when you're in squalor, the house is usually going to be condemned. Um, yeah. It's unfit for anyone to be in there. It's, un- it's un- unhealthy. It's unsafe. Um, and so kind of mentally preparing the family t- to move that individual, right? They're leaving that family home. They may have raised their kids in um, or their partner passed away and, and all their memories are in there. Um, and so, yeah, there's just lots of layers of it's not just the stuff. It's mm. the why behind the stuff. Interesting. So once maybe someone has, you know, um, worked through some of their trauma and they're able to, you know, throw away, give away some of their their items and you've got it down to a manageable level, you're actually not likely to stay in that home. You have to move. When it's a squalor condition or level mm-hmm. five, unless there's some huge, like significant improvement it's usually condemned like the okay. the city or the community has given the family a timeline um mm-hmm. to say like the roof needs to be suitable because usually when we're at a squalor level the rodents the the bugs have literally chewed through everything the wires the the roofing is collapse starting to collapse the flooring starting to give way it's um the plumbing doesn't work like um it's usually a condemned house. So going in and and helping the family or the client say, which are the key items? We can't Mm -hmm. take all of it. And oftentimes they're moving to a one bedroom or a studio and they're coming from this home with thousands and thousands of things. And they're only able to say, maybe take a hundred pieces, right? Um, And so you're working with the client to to grieve, um, it's really grief counseling. Um, so when I talk to families about what they need, I, I also tell them it's a disease model, really, but also grief and loss um, because they're leaving. They know they have to leave this home and it's not by their choice. Um, so anytime we can give clients choice, you're going to be in a way better position to build relationship and partnership with them to be able to let things go. Mm. Um, but that's why you see those hoarding shows, the house, the roof is caved in, the floors are, you know, it's, it's at that point, unless they're going to come in and really overhaul it. Um, but usually they're, they're condemned and they're torn down, uh, usually because of the rodent infestation. Yeah. So once you know, once the the person has moved into a new place, maybe they've got fewer things. How do you maintain it and stop it from, you know, leave, achieving that level five again? Is it possible? Yeah, again, it depends. <laughs> so if they can start to get some psychological support with a psychiatrist, 
Um, and then the organizers like myself, I really do the five, 10, 15 minute routines of, mm -hmm. um, you know, what can you do to maintain and get you into that routine? So instead of letting the dishes sit for a week in stale moldy water, can we get into a routine of you've had breakfast, white, wash the dish, right? Or white, wash the dishes. Um, dishwashers for hoarders is like the worst. Remove the dishwasher, like, <laughs> so, and, and limit the amount of dishes that go with them. So if it's one person, really they only need four plates is the max is, is kind of what I suggest. Um, because we do want them to have friends over, right? Mm -hmm. We want them to socialize. So having a set of three, you know, it's good because you can have two or three friends over. But normally for yourself, if you have like a couple cups and a couple utensils, you have to wash them every day to reuse them. Mm -hmm. um, and shopping is a huge addiction for a lot of hoarders. They go into huge debts um, over really like dollar store quality things, right? And what's so heartbreaking is the amount of bags filled with stuff that's never seen again. So understanding um, the dopamine and the serotonin levels of, of your family members, knowing that it's a dopamine hit they're seeking, can we help them do a different dopamine hit? So for a lot of my clients, I'll do like a playlist where like for me with ADHD, I need the dopamine to like get excited about something boring, right? If it's mm -hmm. boring, I don't want to do it. So I have a playlist that is like poppy music that it's like, I know when I hear that playlist, I'm in the zone, I got to get it done. Um, and so, um, you know, even getting music for your loved one, getting them to have that playlist so that they're doing laundry, doing laundry like every week, sometimes doing laundry a couple times a week so the laundry pile doesn't build because then the bugs start to come in, right? And so, um, or it's the damp, the dampness of our weather or the, you know, all of those things environmental conditions are ripe for mold. So anything we can do to get them in the habit of daily or weekly so it doesn't sit. Um, some of my clients, they use the money to do laundry service. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not piled up. It's, it's completely out of the option, right? It's someone comes and picks it up and, and brings it in. So there's lots of services. Um, so that if you're not, if the, you're the family member that can't help, Maybe you can help financially with a service to help that maintenance piece. Um, and then also limiting their, um, so a lot of my clients will, I'll limit, will go to the bank with their family, of course. I'm not mm -hmm. like telling them what to do with their money, but we'll put a spending cap on their tap. Mm -hmm. So you, you can only spend like $20 a day. Wow. Um, and so then it, it forces them to stop the Amazon shopping, the online shopping, because remember, they're not leaving their houses um, or they are leaving their houses, but they can only spend 20 bucks. We, it's really hard to spend 20 bucks right now, like a coffee, you know, a couple of coffees or a lunch and a coffee. There's 20 bucks. Um, so, yeah, you can you can cap their daily limit, their daily credit card um, as well to limit that because it's an addiction. If you look at it, too, as an addiction, we're addicted to stuff. Um, mm. But they might be addicted to the dopamine hit of someone's being nice to me, um, salespeople, right? Um, they're treating me kindly. I'm getting that socialization. So even um, getting their support groups out there for hoarding and, and squalor. Um, but again, it's really hard getting people to leave their homes. So one of my um, after, after supports is I have a closed Facebook group where any of my clients or any of their friends, they don't have to be a client, we have a safe Facebook group. So anyone can say, hey, I'm really struggling this week, or I really want to tackle this, um, or I really want to go and blow 200 bucks. Can someone help me? Um, so I'm trying to create that safe community because that's that aftercare part that is missing in a lot of um, support, a lot of um, professionals, right? Like we'll go in and, oh, I can come in and clear the clutter, but I want you to learn the skills so you don't have to hire me again, right? Mm. Which isn't a good business model, I know, but um, but I do also do maintenance packages because there's some families, like especially seasonal swaps, 
um, they'll need some support. Or they might have a trigger response where there's a certain part of the year where they go out and spend, spend, spend because it's a grief and loss, right? And so mm-hmm. going out and spending and, and bringing stuff in and surrounding them um, with things, their loved one or whatever the loss is. Um, like I had one client who um, was a huge active person and had a motorcycle accident and was as was a quadriplegic in a wheelchair um, for the rest of their life. But their house was filled with sports equipment, skis, like um, a whole bunch of different things that they would never be able to use. But it was cluttered. And, and I'm like, we need to make safe passages for your wheelchair um where can we move some of these right and um it was because they're grieving the loss of their former life so that was the trauma piece of cluttering all of this um sports equipment it's because Mm. they couldn't couldn't do what they used to do before right yeah Hmm. thank you was there anything else that you know you wanted to touch on um for this section um just please be kind to yourself Um, As the family and friend, it is hard to see your loved ones living the way you don't think they should be living. um, Your expectation is not being met, and that is really hard when you love someone um, to let them continue to live in that way. Um, But yeah, so just self-compassion. Talk to your friends about it. You're not alone. It is really common uh, in terms of chronic disorganization And that slippery slope of when it becomes just chronic disorganization to level one, level three, and then squalor, which is your house is getting condemned because Mm. it's rodent and bug infested. Um, So yeah, seek professional help for yourself um, and also for your loved one if they're open to it. And if they're not, figure out a way to be okay with that. Great. And so you did mention, you know, um, you know, getting into some sort of maintenance and management. And I'd love to know what is something, what is a practice that you do to manage uh, your own home? Okay. So if you asked my daughter, she would say I'm OCD, (laughs) which actually on the horning uh, in the DSM-5, there's that comorbidity of OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. It's actually very linked and related. Um, And that's where the perfectionism procrastination cycle stems from. You need to see it perfect. And so you know you'll never get there, so you don't start. So that's another um, uh, red flag or warning sign. If your loved one is not, you know, needs to be perfect, um, doesn't start or starts and doesn't finish, that's kind of a red flag too. Um, But me, I'm all about routines. Like I said, I have ADHD, so I've had to um, use my timer. So I always have my phone. Um, and I have timers all the time and it'll be like daily, weekly, monthly, seasonally. Like I, I actually do it like quarterly on my phone. Phones are great. Um, unless you forget to charge them. <laughs> so I have a timer or a, I, I used to, I don't need it anymore, but I used to actually have a timer that said, charge your phone. Like, right. <laughs> um, but I'm really big on five, 10 minute routines. Cause that's really all my brain can handle. Um, at any one time. So Mondays, for example, it will be a laundry day. And I know that I'm doing Zoom um, all day with clients. So if I'm doing virtual organizing all day, then I'll put my laundry on during one client, flip it during another, um, dry it, and then fold it. And and one day I've gotten my laundry done without it then taking me like hours. Same with the bathroom. On like a Sunday, I might only do... um, the sink and the mirror and the doorknobs and stuff. The next to the next Sunday, I'll do like the toilet and the bathtub. The next Sunday, I'll do the floors. So really breaking down the tasks for for our family and for other families really helps. Because who wants to work all week and then spend the whole weekend cleaning? No one. So if you can break things down, like five minutes, you can clean your toilet if you've maintained it well. Like, <laughs> you know, um, if you've left it for a couple of months, it might take you a little longer. But again, getting into those weekly routines where you're not spending the whole day cleaning is going to make it easier. Um, and then we've just just doing everything together. So I'm really big on stop the gender rules. I, I hate hearing that's a pink job and a blue job. It drives me crazy. How about this is just a life skill we need to do. 
um, so that we can go to the park. This is something we need to get done so we can go to the zoo or go and watch a movie, um, you know, at the theater. So if you're doing your laundry, everyone do it. Uh, everyone fold it and watch a movie while you're folding it or put on your playlist. And after dinner, everyone has a job tidying for five minutes. Um, and then I'm really big on getting ready the night before. So when we finish dinner, um, whoever cooks, um, they usually do the lunches. And then um, whoever cook or whoever doesn't cook does the cleanup, like puts it in the dishwasher and tidies the floor. And then we get our backpacks. Like then we have a five minute routine before we go to bed. What do we need? What's happening tomorrow? Um, we have our work bags and our backpacks by the door. Um, lunches are in the fridge, so we can just grab and go. And then we have a family calendar. So lots of families have um, their phones. They have shared calendars. Um, that works for a lot of people, but my family, because we're neurodiverse, we need the visual too. So I have a visual on my in our kitchen that has everything color coded. Like everyone has their own color in our family, and then we can just visually see it. And then, oh yeah, what's in my phone as well, right? So mm -hmm. the that what's works for my family, um, and then other ones too. Like because I work with so many neurodiverse families with brain injury. Um, autism and ADHD, that's kind of who I work with the most and physical injuries, visuals are huge. So, so seeing the after I'll take a picture and I'll put it in the kid's bedroom. So when you say go tidy your room, they have a visual what tidy looks like, or this is what a clean bathroom looks like. This is what a clean kitchen looks like or a tidied kitchen. Um, and so that is really helpful um, because then it's just that quick visual. Oh, right. Mom, this is why, or I'll say mom standard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like my daughter will, yeah, I'm like, don't do dad standard, please. Sorry out there, dads. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of you. I know lots of you who are like me and like clean and tidy. And there's some ladies too that are not as tidy as me. So I shouldn't do the, uh, do the gender thing, but I will say, can you make it mom, mom standard, please? Yeah. Those are some I of the tips. I think it's referring to specifically you as mom and no. your partner as dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, I, I like that idea though, because um, my partner and I also have different ideas of what tidy is, and I'll be like, "It's so messy in here," and he's like, "What do you mean? I, I don't, I don't see mess." And then, um, you know, I, I'll list like ten things I think is wrong, but he's like, "Ah, it's fine." Uh, so I love having the idea of like a photo and and saying, "This is what I want it to look like." Yeah. And then compromise is huge. When you're sharing space, that's when lots of fights happen, right? Mm. Um, and like for my daughter, for example, is clutter blind. So she really doesn't see things. It's like, it's, it's a real thing. Um, so your partner may be like, well, who cares if this is out of place? For me though, for my ADHD, it needs to be organized because then it impacts my brain. Then it's like, it's too chaotic. My brain's already chaotic. I need my space to be like not chaotic. Um, and so compromising together around, okay, this is a hill that I need to die on. Can, can we die on this one? And then this is a hill I don't need to die on in this space. Can that be your space? Um, and so, yeah, just navigating those things. Mm -hmm. Clear bins is really helpful. Or if one partner needs to see something and another partner hates seeing something, compromising on a bin, but labeling it. Because the person who needs to see it, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. That's really common with ADHD. So like dresser drawers don't work for a lot of people. Closet drawer, uh, closet doors don't work for a lot of us on the neurodiverse spectrum. But for our non-neurodiverse friends, our, our, our neurotypical partners, they hate seeing like the open mess. They want it nice and close and tidy. So figuring out um, those kind of things is is fun. And I love doing that with families. Um, the biggest family I worked with was 10 uh, in wow. the house. And trying to figure out the front door entranceway for 10 people. Um, yeah, we had to do a lot of uh, compromising. But it, we did figure it out. Yeah, it's amazing. It's pretty fun. It's, I love it. I love what I do. Mm. If you can get If you get 10 people to compromise then I think that, you know, um, everything else should be easy. Yeah. The fact that they actually um, were willing to work with me 
like all of them was was a was a total bonus. <laughs> so, but I I try really hard to make it fun. Like mm-hmm. I'll say what what music do you like? And sometimes it's like, wow, this is really dark and a lot of swear words. But if this is gonna work for you, let's do it, right? Mm-hmm. So again, I'm not there to judge. I'm there to figure out what's gonna work for them uh, to be successful. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and if our listeners want to learn more about you and your business, uh, where can they find you? Oh, so you can go to www.organizingbyoz.com or I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn uh, as well. And I'm on um, Professional Organizers in Canada. I'm on the Education Committee and the Institute of Chronic Disorganization. I'm on their, of course, research uh, committee <laughs> and uh, I've co-written a uh, brain injury and I, I do have an e-course uh, for your do-it-yourselfer and some books as well so um, and I do offer in person and virtual so yeah I'm really happy to help I'm always sharing tips I have a YouTube channel with tons of free stuff on it because I really want people to find success and uh, so yeah hopefully some of the things out there will help you and your listeners I get a little bit more organized or at least understand squalor. Um, it's not about the stuff. It's really the why behind it. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure that all of those links are on our show notes, as well as um, a lot of the references that you use today so that everyone can learn and um, yeah, learn more about squalor and how to help their loved ones. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Room by Room, produced by the Home Organization Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at ho.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.